Um, did you imagine that this would be coming in a title fight, though? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, and you were right. Uh, that was New York 230. After, that was after I beat um, Brad Tavares. And I was looking at what's his name next because I watched him fight the next night after I whooped Brad Tavares. He uh, beat Uriah Faber. Oh, no, it's what's his name? Uriah Hall. And I saw him down uh, backstage. I saw him backstage. But, um, yeah, nothing. It was just crickets. And I had an idea that Dana would want to wait till I'm champ. And then he's rising up. And then have a match like this later on. Just like I said, I'm sure it's out there somewhere in the ether. But, yeah, being said it. In terms of of your, I guess, back and forth with, with Costa. You've gone from fighting a guy like Rob who, who doesn't do much talking and there's not, I guess, a lot of animosity to someone like Costa who seemingly has no filter. Uh, is that, is, do you prefer either one? Does it phase you at all? Does, does it change anything? Well, Rob did do a lot of talking, let's be fair. Um, and I called him out on it. But, yeah, Costa might need a filter because he says some real dumb shit sometimes like, he calls himself the king of bitches. So, I don't know. Maybe he should put a filter on sometimes. He uh, recently revealed that he's, he's walking around at, I think, 220 pounds, uh, which means he's got a fair bit to cut before fight night. Does his size phase you at all? Like, obviously, he's one of the, I guess, bigger middleweights. You're all you're weighing in at the same weight. But, but does that phase you at all? Nope, never has, never will. I fought at heavyweight in boxing, kickboxing, and I will plan on fighting at heavyweight, never met at some point. But, yeah, this is martial arts, this is skills. Size makes a difference if you know how to use it and if you're allowed to make a difference. But, yeah, I'm. <laughs> they're always surprised when they step across the cage from me and they realize how, how, how long I am, how, how my frame. They have to test my, my frame rate as well. And then when they feel me in the clinch and they feel my strength, and yeah, they're always in for a rude awakening. The location of this one hasn't been announced yet, but there's there's some talk that it's it's going to be at the UFC Apex in in Vegas, which is obviously a, a smaller Smaller octagon. cage. That's another narrative I've been hearing. A smaller octagon. Okay. Do you want to put that to bed? Well, look at how I dealt with Brad Tavares in a smaller octagon, and he was pressuring me. I whooped his ass five 0 so. Yeah, I, and I fought in another kickboxing organization with a, a ring against a guy as well who's a Dutch kickboxer and just walks forwards and throws leg kicks and body shots and same style as, uh, what's the name, Paul Acosta, in kickboxing in a tiny phone booth ring. And I still whooped his ass. So I don't know why people think that's like going to play a heavy factor. It's like, cool, we can fight wherever the fight takes place. We might even end up fighting on the ground. It's This is mixed martial arts, man. This is adaptability and triumph. So, yeah. I'm used to this. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Scotty. We're going to go now to Chris uh, Reed from New Zealand Herald. Good day, mate. Uh, just wondered if you could talk to the, uh, I guess, the, the history around this event, obviously yourself and Costa both being undefeated and, uh, you know, a few of your teammates joining you for the ride. Yeah, um, me and Costa have been two rising forces in the UFC. And I initially called him out after I beat Brad Tavares. I told Dana White when I met him for the first time, I told him I want to fight that guy next. And he kind of alluded to the fact that it's probably not the best fight for now because it'll take a while to build us up as our own entities and then have a super fight like we are right now. So, yeah, it's a perfect storm. Um, but... Yeah, I've been trying to fight him for a while. And he tried to, remember he tried to say he doesn't know who I am? Ha ha ha. Boy, you know who I am now. And obviously, you would have known uh, for a little while that uh, Brad, Shane, and Kai are going to be on the card with you. Um, could you just talk about how, how good it is fighting with, with uh, the boys again? Fuck yeah. I mean, we've done a 3 P twice now, so now we're going to do a, a, what do you call it? Quadruple P? Quadri P? However you call it. But, um, yeah, it's it's beautiful because right now we're all together, huddled up, locked down at the gym. And this is literally, I, I can say this for a fact, the best training camp I've been having. Just because we're here at the gym, wake up, train, chill. It's just back to the simple life. It kind of throws it back for me to how it was in China, you know? Like, 
the simple things. And uh, all I had in my mind was the pursuit of, of greatness. So even if this lockdown ended on Sunday or last Friday, I would have still taken the three days being here as, as a refresher because you need sometimes a refresher or a reset. And being here has done that for me because I have fuck all to do outside of this. I have no distractions. I have no obligations. All my responsibilities I handle over the phone or online. And I, I've learned to say no to a lot of new things and just focus on what I want to do. Wake up in the gym, train, eat, have a nap, and then wake up, train again, chill with the boys, and sleep. Just just on lockdown, uh, was it frantic at all trying to organize uh, getting the boys into the gym before the, the deadline? No, not at all. It was easy. Because we're always in the gym anyway. We pretty much spend half our times here, so we are our own bubble anyway. So, yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't an issue. You just said, "Oh yeah, um, I've got an idea." Blah blah blah. Cool. We're in there within the hour. So, man, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Mm. Thanks, Chris. I'm gonna go to Mike Bond now from MMA Junkie. <laughs> can you hear me yeah perfect what's up perfect uh dana white said the other night about 10 times that he thinks this is going to be the fight of the year for 2020 uh what do you think is is that what we're going to see on september 26th or are you hoping for a, a cleaner type of performance that's like performance of the night um i think a performance of the year shut out of the year shut down of the year maybe uh fight of the year i've already had that in my back pocket but if it happens again i just don't think it's going to happen just because of the situation if and you have to be you have to be smart enough to put it together this guy gasses after the first round got five rounds look at me in the in all my fights in the fifth round and in the, in the sixth round i mean no sixth round in the fifth round oh, so what am i saying i got distracted look at me on my f fights in the fifth round and the fourth round third round the later rounds i'm always fresh so yeah precision is going to be the key in this fight. Precision skill and just taking them out one by one. No doubt. And I actually had the chance to talk to Paulo a couple of weeks ago, and I asked when this is all said and done if you guys will be able to make peace and shake hands. And he said, no way am I going to be shaking Izzy's hand after I knock him out, etc." What about you? Are you willing to make peace with this guy, or is this something that's going to go on beyond the fight? Peace. Uh, ugh, bro, I don't know. What am I thinking? <gasps> you can get closure. Closure, like, even you know when you, like, break up with someone and you look for closure to try. You don't need to look for closure with anyone. Closure comes within yourself. So, yeah, after I knock him out, I'm just going to carry on with my day. Fair play. It's and closed. Not... It's closed. There you go. And, you know, the, a lot of important middleweight fights coming up soon. We were supposed to have Hall and Romero this weekend. That obviously got pushed back. But uh, they announced Whitaker and Cannoneer, which seems like it could be a, a title eliminator. What do you just kind of make of the lay of the land? And who do you think is going to be the guy who emerges from all that? Uh, after the the belt? I love it. Um, I was definitely looking forward to, um, what do you call it, Darren Hill, that fight. But since Rob beat him, good job. Um, I'm surprised he's taking the fight with Cannonier. Good on him. But yeah, I like that. I, I like that matchup. Um, don't really care who wins, but I'd rather Cannonier win so I can get a fresh body. Yeah, I think that'd be a little soon for the Rob rematch. I mean, obviously for him it would be good two wins, but that wouldn't be that much time in between. Eh, I've done worse, so he'll be right. <laughs> if he does it right, he'll be right. Fair play. And last thing from you, just the, tell us the inspiration behind going pink with the hair. We know you were blonde before and you changed it up again. I like to switch it up on people, give them the unexpected, because people always expect something. And for me, expect the unexpected. I ever saw a meme. What was the meme? Uh, Sean O'Malley dyes his hair the, the colors of the rainbow. No one bats an eye. Star Brennan dyes his hair pink. And it's breaking news. And everyone loses their mind. I don't know why... The color of a man's hair can get you in your feels. But yeah, I don't know. I like it. Imagine if I had pink hair and I whooped this motherfucker's ass. I might it might be another color by the time the fight comes around, but right now I'm fucking with this. It's it's beautiful. It's like candy floss. Excellent. Thanks, Izzy. Appreciate it. All good.
Thanks, Mike. I'm going to go now to Clay Wilson from Radio New Zealand. Hey, Izzy. How you doing, mate? Very well. What's up? What's up? Hey, you spoke about it a bit before, but just in terms of Auckland going into to level three, how much impact has that had or not had on in terms of, of your training and how is it working logistically? How you manage oh, it? It's had a great impact on my training, to be honest, because we thought on the fly and came up with a plan to uh, adhere to the lockdown rules. So, yeah, it's had a great impact on my training because I get to just live at the gym like I I stay I spend most of my time at the gym anyway but now I get to sleep at the gym wake up in the gym and just hit the ground running train get work done so yeah it's had a great impact on my camp so you guys obviously doing that didn't need any sort of exemption or clearance from the from the officials to train or anything no of course not because we're what were we doing before the lockdown we we're training been in each other's bubbles anyways so we decided to just be exclusively in each other's bubbles and just in terms of, of leaving what's the process with that do you guys need to go through any particular protocols or get any government clearances or ufc you mean to travel to get out of the country uh that's need to know basis so i'll leave that for now cool thank you mate cool cool Thanks, Clay. I'm going to throw now to Jake Michaels from ESPN. Hey, how are you, how are you going? Very well, very well. What's up, Jake? Uh, you kind of touched on it before, but how proud are you of uh, of everything the gym has already achieved? Very proud. I'm very proud of us. And uh, being here with the team, uh, locking down with my crew is making me even I don't know if I could be any prouder, but it's just strengthening the bond between me and my comrades, me and my brothers. So, yeah, uh, I, I love the vibe we're on right now. It's a whole vibe. And what's it been like in, in New Zealand in the last couple of years? You know, you've, you've had a, a pretty meteoric rise. And how have you found the, the love for UFC growing over the last couple of years? Oh, Jesus. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, the sport's growing rapidly constantly um so much is happening so much is happening that we keep even having to look at new options because the gym's getting packed every day um even after the first lockdown uh yeah mma is just it's the biggest sport in the world people just don't know it yet i understand that there's football and soccer and blah 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 but all those people watch the ufc all those people watch us because you know we all know what we're trying to do. We're trying to be the baddest motherfuckers around. So whether you kick a ball into a net, dunk a ball, or you charge another man, when you fight, people watch. That's in our DNA. Do you think uh, UFC could ever sort of overtake rugby as the, the number one sport in, in New Zealand? Don't really care, to be honest. But I know, like, if you put it on the world stage, me, myself, as Israel, I decided the last style being I'm bigger than the All Blacks. Like worldwide, not definitely in New Zealand. So I know you media people are gonna try and use that as a soundbite, and then use that as your little fucking clickbait or whatever. But yes, worldwide, all around the world, all across the land, I definitely have more footprint than the All Blacks. Thank you very much, mate. Best of luck. Thumbs up. Izzy, that might be it. Um, is there anyone else that's got any questions for Izzy before we let him go? There are no stupid questions. Ask away. Five, four. I've got, three. here we go. Still on. Um, Peter from Fight News. Take it away. The, the living situation. So uh, all the boys at CKB, they're all living at, at the gym right now. Is that, is that right? Yep, a select few, not all all our training partners, but a select few that we already were in contact with are uh, all bubbled up at the gym right now. And do you mind just going into a little bit more detail? Like, is everybody bunking on the ground, or how, how does that work? Yeah, we can go into detail. So, okay, my situation, right? So I brought, I, I got the single mattress from uh, my house out west. I got my brother to bring it, and, you know, I put it fucking on the hardwood floor, and I was sleeping on it. I was being all nostalgic, like, fuck, this is... Like how China and Diamond's like my roommate 
or he's in the in the jujitsu room with me or with a few other people and i'm just vibing this whole nostalgic thing but then i realized fuck that because i already know what it's like so i got another mattress that's much bigger much more comfortable because i can't sacrifice my sleep and now i'm sleeping on the floor like a king but yeah it's beautiful man like the kitchen here is just packed with fucking I don't know, everyone cooking pantries and yeah you just bunking with us he's waking us up with his early morning songs horrible horrible um and yeah it's a vibe you should be here but you're not so no problem thanks izzy uh that's all for me good luck with the fight cool Thanks, Pete. I'm going to go to Brad Lewis now from News Hub. Hey, Izzy. How you doing, mate? What's up, B-Rad? <laughs> hey, bro. Um, I know you're someone who does enjoy your alone time. Um, is there anything challenging about the bubble? Um, no. No, I, 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 I love my alone time. But, like, I, uh, it's so easy. Like, we, how do I put it this way? I don't have to entertain anyone. You know, like those friends you have to constantly entertain and there has to be always a dialogue going on or there has to be some kind of conversation. Nah, I could just sit in the marae. That's the jiu-jitsu room. We call it now, the marae. I could sit in there with everyone and just not say a word, just be in our own bubble. So I can get my alone time whenever I need to. But then we also have times when we're around the barbecue or we're around the play session just having bands. But yeah, there's no problem having my alone time. Or being introverted in in this space. Um, and one one more from me, Izzy. Uh, Dana um had mentioned uh you know that the uh that he was considering New Zealand um for a potential fight card. How close do you think it was to this fight card being in New Zealand? Uh, if you think he was taking it, I, I think it was serious. But there's a lot of money being invested in advance for these shows. You have to realize that. They don't just happen. They do happen like that. You know, we've seen the UFC do it before, move a whole show, you know. But, um, yeah, most times there's a lot of money invested in these shows beforehand, 10, 12 months, 18 months beforehand sometimes. So, yeah, I don't know. That's business shit. But it will happen eventually if this whole corona thing keeps going on uh, and we kick its ass again like we're going to do the second time. Um, then, yeah, I see a fight card happening in New Zealand in the near future. Thank you, brother. Cool. Thanks, Brad. We're just going to go back to Gardy from Fox Sports. Hey, mate. I, uh, I thought I'd ask you uh, while we have you. The Costa fight came after a couple of years of you maybe uh, thinking about it and talking about it a little bit. Another fight you've been talking about for a little little bit now is, is that John Jones super fight. He's moved up to heavyweight. In terms of that move, uh, does that impact your plans on the super fight with him? Would you want that at light heavyweight? Would you consider, I know Eugene's talked about you moving up to heavyweight at some point in your career. Uh, what are your thoughts on on that? 100%. It doesn't change my plans. My plans are still going as forward as planned. So, yeah, same thing. No thoughts on him moving up to heavyweight at all in terms of what, what he's leaving okay, behind well, in that I mean, Okay, well... Look, look how long it took him to move up to heavyweight, finally. And like I was saying, he was expecting me to do it straight away when I've never defended my belt yet. So I've defended my belt twice now. I want to defend it a few more times and then do what I set out to do. But yeah, hot color the kettle black on his part. So yeah, go put some fucking muscle on your chopstick legs and go fight Francis Ngannou, watch him break you. I hope he doesn't, though. <laughs> Maybe he does. Who knows? <laughs> Thanks, Izzy. All right, we've got another one from Chris from New Zealand Herald. Hey, mate, just uh, sort of numbers-wise, how many of you guys are staying at the gym? Uh, so far, 10. That's including Eugene. Sweet. Easy. Thank you, man. Cool, cool. Is that a trick question, Chris? Is that it? No. I'm just checking if you other guys still have their hands raised. Clay, did you have any more questions? No, Mike. Oh, there we go. 
given what's going on in the world and the fact that New Zealand's come back under more um, restrictive conditions, how do you feel about just having the chance to compete and you'll have a, probably a few more eyeballs even than you would have had in a normal circumstance? It's uh, a good question. I think it is awesome. I think it is cool. Uh, yeah, more money. As I see it, the pay-per-view always goes up like it did for the first lockdown when um these dudes got, um, what was it? I think it was 250 or 249, whatever card it was. Uh, yeah, just more money, more eyeballs. So it makes sense. I'm looking forward to it. It's a great fight as well. Great opponent, stylistically. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a show out and I can't wait. And we've got four, uh, three other guys as well on the card that's, yeah, it's just that. It's the same feeling I'm used to. We've had it twice in Melbourne with the boys, where it's just we go through the camp together and then we rise together in the um in the trenches when it's time to go to work. So it's it's familiar to me. And just in terms of your standing in the UFC, what do you think a win over Paulo does? Where does it put you in terms of the sort of level of stardom and that rise that you've had? I think I think it's years? great. I think it's great for me because it's that um. The aesthetic of it, like I'm this skinny person, this little frail kid that everyone looks at, and then he looks like the perfect antagonist. He's big, bulky, juice to the fucking kills, and he's gonna, he's a marauder. He's a guy that beats everyone on the fence. So when I come in there with some Bruce Lee shit, fuck him up, it's gonna, oh my god, wow, he beat that big muscle boy. Oh, like the casuals are gonna feed off it, and that's just, I love that because it means more eyes, more attention. And like I said, you can watch my fights. You know, I have to watch my fights, but you're going to pay. I'm not talking money. You're going to pay attention. Attention turns to, as always. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Cool, cool. Thanks, Clay. All right, last question. We're just going to finish with Mike Fawn if you've got any more questions. For you, just two for you. Yeah, I think you uh, you did a nice job selling it there a little bit. But to circle back to this fight, it's a special one, and the fact it's just the second time in UFC history two male fighters have who are undefeated have fought for a belt. The other one being uh, Leota Machida and Rashad Evans way back in two thousand nine. Yes, so, ninety eight. I remember that. Yes, sir. So like that, that's a pretty special moment. I know you're a big combat sports fan and everything. Can you just speak to what that kind of means having this type of matchup come together and to be part of it? This is perfect. I was expecting what I was expecting for my last fight is going to happen this fight. Because, and, and it's, bro, it's, you can't understand. Uh, so, how do I put this? In my story, right, you can't just have it like going good and going great. In, in a story, you need a dip, you need a bit of a valley when things go shit. And that was me for my last fight after the, the performance that Roy Morrell brought whatever his name is, blah, 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 blah. He um, was lackluster. I've never been in a boring fight in my life. I had all these criticism, you know, justly or unjustly. And then that was, a, that, was a, that was a dip. And now this is the rise back. And what better antagonist than this guy who was undefeated, a KO artist. Um, he looks the way he does, you know, ballooned up. And I'm just, it's like David and Goliath. And I fucked this guy up. It just it's it's spectacular as you know, as they would say, someone's always got to go. Yeah, it's it's a beautifully set up story. Yeah, it's a beautifully set up story. You couldn't write the shit, you could, but it's real. Israel. Love it. And last thing, I uh, haven't got to speak to you since you were announced as the cover athlete for the UFC four video game. Uh, you know, someone who's such a fan of that world and anime and all that kind of stuff, just what does that mean to be a cover athlete on a video game like that? Yeah, it's dope. Uh, it's premonitions, man. I've always felt I was going to be on the cover of the game. Um, I like the new look of the game. I like the different modes. Like, I think I'm in the Kumite mode. Like, I run that shit. Um, yeah, it's cool. It's just... Like, I, I buzz about it, but I know the kid in me, like the 11-year-old Izzy, would be going nuts to be able to play himself right now. And I've only had a chance to play it a couple of times already, but yeah, soon. <laughs>